On my right, at, that you've heard from, Steve Fairless, who is from Power Oracle, who Jeff referred to as one of our technical advisors in the project. So thanks, Steve, for being with us this morning. Vivian Griffin, who you've heard from, um, and Mark Purcell and Annie Nolan. So we've got lots of questions here. Any particular order, I'm just going to pose some of these questions. I think we'll have some duplicates, but uh, we'll see how many we can get through. So the first one is um, the options on battery feed in scheme providers. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Who asked that question, please? Could you just repeat it in a question I'm form? Who, who would, what kind of provider would what kind of provider would you sign up with? Okay. To feed in from your battery. So, who would like to answer that question? Jeff. Jeff. Uh, yeah, I can. I can answer that one. But uh, the way that the first battery for Nusaville will work, there will be no. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm more from my own battery. My own battery. My own battery. I'm sorry. I'm not quite sure of the question then. I think it was Mark. Mark mentioned he's getting feed in from his battery. You're getting a better tariff. Yeah. Uh, well, different tariff. So, different so tariff. yeah, not necessarily better. Um, so yeah. So obviously, in in the Noosa region, we're all with Energex, and Energex is the is the sort of the, the, the network provider. There's a whole bunch of retailers who provide services. Um, there's a government service called Energy Made Easy, and uh, and jump on there and put in your circumstances. Um, at Zen, we don't actually sort of acknowledge, uh, or sorry, um, prefer one um, retailer over another. Um, that said, I'm with a wholesale market um, energy provider, a retailer. Um, so if you want to be able, if you want to search that for, for a wholesale market retailers, um, they, you can end up in the same place. I just can't name them um, directly in this community organisation. You can't name them, but don't recommend them. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I can name them. So yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm with uh, Am Amber Electric, so they're a wholesale market retailer. Um, I would um, give you a word of caution that the, the, the high prices are really high, $16 a kilowatt hour. The low prices are really low, minus five cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so if you have the, the risk appetite and the ability to manage within those parameters, then you can do really well. I have a home battery, so when the price goes to $15 a kilowatt hour, I'm able to export to the market and get that feed-in tariff. If I didn't have a battery, that's what I'd be paying to run my house. So, so just a word of caution, um, the, the, the highs are high and the lows are low. Um, but if you can get it the right way around, if you can run your household for nothing um, during the day, and if you can export at night, you can, you can make some really good returns. $15, yes. Yeah, it's thanks, thanks, Mark. The next uh, next question is around the longevity of batteries. So, Steve, is that something you'd like to talk about? Uh, yes, yeah, so I've just put a home uh, battery in, and I've done a lot of research on on batteries, private research, etc. Um, there was a the battery test centre in Canberra, which was funded by a government body, which was called Arena, and that's just closed. It's called Solar Quotes. That's closed just recently. So they tested a, a multitude of batteries uh, over uh, since 2017, and at some stage or other, there was there were failure modes uh, at, at, at different levels. Some some not very significant. Some very significant. Um, uh, so I, uh, I think um, there's a lot of battery, battery technologies out there, that's all I can say, and I think um, I've put my home battery and I've, I've got a Tesla Powerwall too. Uh, even though I tried to avoid lithium, uh, it was very difficult to do at this point in time, but there are other battery technologies coming uh, and currently on the market, but not particularly for home batteries. Uh, so does, uh, does that answer your question at all? Who asked that question? It wasn't my question, but I think it might have been a community battery. The community battery? Uh, the longevity, the community battery. Oh, the longevity. Um, and Jeff, you can probably answer that, because we know what the battery's going to be, but I, I, I know the longevity of my home battery and, and, and what the warranties are, and generally they're 10 years in that case, but 
Can we just let Jeff answer the question? Thanks. Yeah, sure, George. Um, yeah, batteries, uh, community batteries, like any other batteries, gradually degrade over time. And just to give you an example, I've got an electric vehicle, I've had a, a Tesla Model 3 for three and a half years now. And so uh, I know that it's, it is degraded by about 6% in the three and a half years that I've had it. So I think that's probably typical if you, if you treat the battery well, uh, that's sort of degradation you're going to get. So after 10 years, that's probably the expected, well, that's the, that, that's, that, that's a reasonable lifetime for one, one, one of these batteries. They will last for, for, last for longer for that, but it's to do with what the manufacturers are going to, go and, go and warranty. Uh, but, you know, at least 10 years, but in 10 years time, the whole technology is going to change. And so uh, replacement of cells and so on um, you know, will probably mean that you know, you're going to get uh, replacements uh, much, much cheaper than uh, what the initial prices are now. And the boxes of infrastructure probably can still all be retained. This gentleman here, did you have a follow-up question about that you wanted to clarify? Okay, so the next uh, associated question is what's the cost of replacement and I assume this relates to a community battery. Who'd like to have a go at that question? It, it's about the community battery? Yeah. 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 Well I really can't talk about that oh, because the battery is, is part of the, the cost but you know the battery longevity is, is based on the, 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 the cyclic discharge of the battery. Yeah. If you have, uh, oh, I don't know what the battery cycle, uh, 5,000 cycles, Jeff, or more for the Pixie battery, the community battery that we're proposing, sorry, sorry. What, what, what are the, what are the life, what, what's, the, what's the, the warranty on the number of cycles for its lifetime? Uh, I don't know that number off yeah. but certainly we can take that yeah. one on notice. But, I'll give you, it, it, it's probably not a lot of difference from my home battery, which is fairly new, and it, it had a life cycle of uh, over 10 years of, say, 5,000 cycles, which is a full charge and a discharge. But I, I find I'm only half discharged. So theoretically, from an engineering point of view, that the life cycle of that battery may extend out to 20 years plus, okay? Now, uh, and I'm, that's, I'm, I'm probably coming down to around about uh, overnight, discharging overnight into a, into a domestic uh, property. Uh, I'm going down to about 40%, but it's, it's fully charged uh, about down. I, I can make another comment. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I know with the community battery that uh, they've got in North Fitzroy that the Garrett Energy Foundation are running, so it's it's virtually the same as this. Uh, it uh, is by the same manufacturer, Pixie. And incidentally, Pixie is a manufacturer that, uh, of the batteries, uh, of the ground mount batteries that Energex uh, are trialling uh, with Oregon Energy in the Ipswich region. So I know that you know Energex and, and Steve can assist is that they really, safety, safety, safety is their first criteria and they're not going to put in any infrastructure that they're not confident uh, with. But just in terms of the question about how the batteries are run, in the Yarra Energy Foundation, they, they run, at the moment, they run it to 70% fully charged, is what, and then 30% they take it down to. So they're being quite conservative in the way they're, they're running it because they want to just make sure they can get a full lifetime out of the battery. Thanks, Steve and Jeff. A uh, question that I think a few people probably have on their mind. Who will maintain a community battery, check its safety, and finance repairs and upgrades to the battery? So, Vivian, you're nodding your head. Would you like to answer that one? <laughs> Um, I think we'll pass to Annie because she was yes. um, doing the homework on that as part of the application. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so with this uh, community battery that's proposed for Nooseville, uh, Council will be the owner and the operator of that battery. So as part of the um, 
Uh, the business case that we put to council is that we looked at the operating costs and the, which included the maintenance and maintaining the safety of that. And so that would be uh, done as part of a contract with a third party as well. And that would go on and on for the uh, lifetime of the battery. And so how that would actually be recouped, the operating costs, would be through the revenue model that we would gain from entering into that, um, I suppose, a wholesale market of actually purchasing electricity when it's really, really cheap during the middle of the day from all of the solar, and then actually putting it back um, into that grid for when when the property, uh, sorry, when the electricity prices are higher. So we, as part of the application, we've identified that we would actually maintain, operate that, and that would be done through a third, third party. That single battery? That community battery, correct. Right. What about the other 100? Depends on who owns and operates them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is an association. So, so what benefit should the public? So the benefit to the, the public is a couple of things. One is that in terms of the financial model, is that we would be putting any excess revenue gained from operating this battery into a fund that would be um, go further into actually putting in emissions reductions within the community. And then the other thing is, is that where the, the uh, houses that are actually on this low voltage network, they are actually using um, a percentage of, a higher greater percentage of renewable energy at night. Um, so they're actually reducing their emissions overall. The other thing is, is that as, um, as more and more solar comes on, on that Energex is going to need to actually upgrade its infrastructure. And so if we can actually store that and actually have that buffer, we're actually sort of uh, protecting against potentially uh, increasing costs into the future as well. So there's a number of community benefits. In terms of direct benefits from, uh, sorry, financial benefits to those people within that low voltage network, their um, relationship with the, their own retailer remains the same, their feed-in tariff remains the same. Um, so it is really a, a, an overall community benefit. And um, if, if I can just direct um, a further response from Steve, because we mentioned during the presentation, Jeff mentioned about um, how we have a grid designed for one-way flows and in fact the huge benefit we're getting from renewable energy and solar but that's actually creating a system of two-way flows. Now that presents, as I briefly alluded to, some emerging problems for, potential problems for the grid and Steve, do you just want to have a couple of words about that? Thanks. Uh, well, the grid, as Viv said, it's, it's, it's normally just a one, one flowing, so since uh, solar has been coming on roofs for quite a few, probably a couple of decades now, I'd imagine, it started creating problems from, from day one because um, modern day inverters have a, a lot of protection systems within them from uh, that look at frequency and under voltage, over voltage, uh, so they're, they're, they're protecting uh, their system. But what those, the early, uh, early days, and, and it continued for some time, was solar systems, people were investing in, in rooftop solar, but they found their, their rooftop solar was tripping off and, and they, they were going back to the government sort of saying, well, you know, you're promoting these schemes, you want us to do this, but it's tripping off all the time. Now that, that was purely re, re, uh, related to the voltage that the Energex, the, the PALs and wires people uh, had to operate their voltage with, within an envelope. Yeah, that's a regulatory requirement by the regulator across the National Electricity Network. So that created a lot of problems. So the government basically is said to uh, DNSPs like Energex, because the government really owned, owned the PALs and wires, said, so, well, you better fix the problem for the customer. So that meant a lot of uh, reconfiguring the network, uh, going out to some of the, the transformers that are supplying these networks to lower lower their voltages. And that seemed to fix that problem for a long time. In the meantime, the growth of solar has continued, continued, continued to the stage where you end up with the duck curve over here, 
where it's trying to push it's trying to push um, electricity from remote sources back up towards where the generator is coming, which was mainly from coal and gas fired. But these sub the substations, like Jeff mentioned, Koran, have very sophisticated systems in there to maintain that regulatory voltage requirement, and and uh, that's creating a lot of problems for the network. So that's managed. You don't see that, but that's managed by the by the uh, by the the likes of Energex and Ergon, etc. So it does create a lot of problems, and uh, and it's, it, com it comes under a banner called distribution energy resources or distributed energy resources, which are generators that are all over the place. So, uh, but it's being managed at the moment, but um, and and it will continue to be because they're required to by law, uh, and you don't have these these solar systems tripping offline anymore. That's that's been reviewed as as we speak. Thanks. So we are. You're on a single phase, on a single phase service, like I am as well, it's limited to five to five kilowatts. That that's that's a, that's a limitation on your service. If you're three phase, I think Mark, you're limited to ten. Ten per phase, so thirty. Yeah, thirty. So that's that's a three phase system. So that's that's a you know that's that's a, that's just the limit of your service for a single phase service and the regulator won't allow a bigger service and I can't think what the size of the conductor is, but uh, it's five kilowatt. If you want to go high, you can you could go to go to three, but uh, hence, uh, you know, in, in my case personally, I found my feeding tariff was gradually dropping down and down, so I put a home battery in so that I can store that and, 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 and expand it at night, which we're doing. Thanks everybody for contributing to that answer. Um, a different question here, why buy a home battery if community batteries are the way of the future? Oh, to you, Mark. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, as, as you would have seen in the, in, in the mix up on the up of the board there, um, we've got a range of storage options and a range of uh, activities happening. So we've talked about pumped hydro, which is effectively a really large battery. Um, and then we have batteries at various tiers and various levels and, and it really is up to individuals to consider their, their own personal circumstances. Um, I, have a, I have a home battery because that suits my needs, it doesn't suit everyone's needs. Community batteries are a way of sharing a, uh, a common resource over, over a community. So the example out at Nooseville, 71 houses will be able to share that, share that battery. <coughs> and so it's much more economically feasible having 71 houses sharing one community battery of those 71 houses, I'm quite positive that a couple of them probably do have their own home batteries. And again, it just provides another tier of, of, of support, another tier of redundancy. If you have a home battery, then you'll have greater energy security. You'll know that you have the energy on your premises. If there is a blackout in your street, your house will continue to operate. If you are relying on a community battery, then the community will continue to operate. If you're relying on hydro or, or other uh, uh, remote energy sources, you'll, you'll be relying on the, the, the distribution and the networks. So it really is a, a decision for individuals. Um, community batteries aren't going to be rolled out ubiquitously everywhere. We have this ambitious target of 100, maybe 200 for the Noosa region. That will happen in a staged fashion and individual circumstances will dictate whether a, a home battery makes sense for you or not. Can I just check one thing you just said? So community battery, it's still grid connected, isn't it? So it's not it's not acting as a as a microgrid that's actually if the grid goes down then you can still operate. It's a different it's not that yeah, that we're yeah, talking about. What's sorry. Yeah, so the community battery will have a fixed uh, storage capacity and as Jeff was talking, the error battery they charge it up to 70% and then they reduce it down to 30%. So if you get to 30%, then, then what will happen is the energy will continue to flow to your houses. It will just be coming direct from the grid or maybe a, a, a battery or, or an energy generation source at a higher tier. Sorry, I'm still not understanding. If the grid goes down, then surely... No, no, no. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it, it will be possible in the future for the, for the community battery to act as a... As, as a backup to the grid. The way that it's configured in North Fitzroy at the moment, it doesn't work that way. So if the grid goes down, the battery stops discharging, 
but but there's no reason why it couldn't be configured in a different way. It's just that the first in the first off, they just wanted to keep it as simple as possible. So I don't know whether Steve, you might want to add anything to that. It's uh, it's, it's how you want to configure the, the software. Actually, I mean, my home battery is configured. I've, I've retained twenty percent of the charge for. Uh, a loss of power situation because the power is normally out for and you know I, I used to manage the control center on the coast here and uh, you know the figures generally you got most power back on within two hours and, and there's been we've had some catastrophic events in this shower here as well but I've uh, reserved 20% for for loss of supply and I've had one uh, already uh, but as long as I've got lights and power, or the convenience of doing that, I just I, don't, I wouldn't be, you know, putting the oven on or or cooking. But it, it, it it's just a convenience, and it did, I didn't even have to reset any of the clocks or anything. But the, the community battery is uh, of your term as microgrid is still part of a microgrid, uh, but it's not going to be configured that way to have to provide uh, total loss supply capability. But it could be in future. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, an associated question that's been partly answered, but I'll ask it anyway. In the event of battery failure, what happens to the power being generated by solar panels on people's roofs? And where does um, the energy go if the battery is disabled for maintenance? Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, look, for a safety point of view, having worked in the network for a long time, uh, when when the um, you lose the power from the network at the moment, uh, they they allow you to generate to your home, like my home battery, but I but I can't and solar won't won't export to the grid because it's a safety issue for the guys out there working. You can't have any generation running while they and they've got a lot of checks and balances to do to access the poles and wires, and that would never happen. But you can't have any form of generation, so it's a safety point of view. So when I talked about inverters having all this protection, when when you lose the supply to the house, uh, for instance, and you've got solar only, your solar won't still try and export out of the grid because your inverter says, look, I've got a problem, I'm not going to export out here. It, it, it'll, uh, it should still, uh, I've never tested that, supply your house, but it won't let you export, that's the problem. Okay. Thank you. There's a couple of questions here um, from people who have concerns about fires and lithium batteries. So in the event of a fire, either battery or bush fire, how will it be extinguished? Oh. <laughs> I've just been reading some information that, funny enough, lithium, when lithium was first put into batteries, it, it did get quite hot. Even in, in, in my industry, it was put into control systems and it was lithium and uh, and, if, and if you let it charge too much, it used to get hot, etc. It's moved a long, long way from then. So now you'll, you'll see the term LFP, which is lithium iron phosphate, iron being FE. They've added iron in there to control the heat. Jeff's got a, a Tesla vehicle. The, the, in the electric vehicles, the batteries are cool. They've got a pretty neat cooling system on the batteries. My home battery is lithium iron phosphate and it has very good ventilation and cooling but I, I don't have it inside the garage. I have it you know, on the outside wall in a, in a fairly shady area. Um, as far as fires go, it's an interesting discussion recently um, uh, from, uh, I, I think it was Australian, about um, emergency services in dealing with with uh, EV fires, and very, there's very few and far behind, between because the lithium, once it starts to burn, you're not going to, you can't put it out by conventional means. So uh, the resulting, they've got to come up with new techniques because at the end of the day, if you've got a, like a scooter battery that you've hear, heard about on the news, which has created some problems because kids or whatever are plugging other charges and you're at the wrong voltage and making them very hot. So they can extinguish a lithium battery fire, generally, if they said you need to just put it in a bucket of water. 
you know, because it'll continue to burn. So uh, that is an issue, but as I said, we've moved a long way from, from uh, household batteries uh, at where lithium's involved. And there are other, other battery technologies coming that are really exciting. Yeah, there's, uh, there's one company I've been dealing with which I have a sodium ion battery, which is salt. Uh, yeah. And it has a carbon anode in it, and the carbon anode is made from uh, coconut shells. The, um, they've got silicon involved with lithium, that's another battery technology that's coming and in this country we've got flow batteries that use uh, uh, zinc bromide, etc, which is, which is very safe. Uh, it is, yeah, so we've got some good companies in this country. Your cooling system is the air con system attached to the battery. Is there a mechanism that allows you to see whether the air con is functioning at its efficient rate? And what happens when, uh, I, my understanding is that batteries need to be kept at a constant 20 degrees Celsius, uh, something like that, or, or constant, a constant temperature to, to be efficient. What happens when the air con um, function fails? That, that's a function of the, of the community battery. Chet, can you answer that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I don't have the precise details about the operating, but I think the operating temperatures certainly go well above 20. Uh, but the the uh, air conditioners are there just to to help to, to keep the temperatures down. Uh, I'll have to take that on notice to say what what happens. But uh, I w I would imagine there's a, there's an awful lot of control systems built into these things. And so when something starts to go out of whack, I mentioned there'll be a signal sent to say if there's something wrong there, better go attend it. And certainly, you know, do things like uh, shut down the battery so it doesn't charge or discharge because that's when the heat is generated. Well, I guess that'd be liquid cooled anyway, so like the Tesla batteries are liquid cooled. Mm. Mm. I don't, don't think they are. Uh, but I'll just, I also mentioned as well the I was very pleased to hear that, that Energex are using the same uh, battery manufacturer, which is which is Pixie um, from, from Norway, as uh, as we're proposing as what so it's also what uh, you know, Energy Foundation have used. Now, now I know that that Energex and Steve can back this up. That the degrees of, of of work that Energex go to safety. You know, for instance, they explained to us with the pole top batteries that they're trying. The first thing they did. They took an empty box and they and they worked out how they could safely put that box, empty box that the battery would fit in, put it on a power pole and take it down and have guys getting up there to maintain it and so on like that. So they go to an awful lot of degrees like that. And I know also what they would be doing as well. They would have all the arrangements with the local uh, fire brigade and so on about what all the procedures will be in the event of a, of a fire. Yeah. Oh, I just um, we've actually just installed some batteries for here as part of our, our bushfire resilience, and um, so in terms of the protection, there are about three layers of protection for this battery that's actually just been, been installed at the J and is one at the um, leisure centre as well. So in the event of an emergency and we lose power, as Steve was just saying, what he can do at home, we'll also be able to uh, operate the lights and the um, basically the lights and the power on this particular level. So in terms, as I said, there are three levels of, and I won't go into all the technology because I'm not going to pretend that I'm an electrical engineer, but there are three le at least three levels of uh, technology built into those actual batteries. And then what happens with the fire brigade, if there is such an incident, um, all throughout the switchboard there are procedures and policies and requirements for the, for the fire brigade to understand that there is actually a battery on site so that they actually can take all the required precautions, particularly around um, breathing apparatus, etc. So all of those sorts of things would actually be um, communicated to the, to the fire brigade as well. As part of that whole process that you know, I explained about before is that there's a whole lot of hoops to actually get um, to actually siting this community battery on the location that has been suggested. So that would be part of that process that we go through in siting the battery. 
And, and just adding that, that I mentioned uh, previously the community reference group that we would establish. So part of their job is going to be asking and making sure they get answers to those hard questions as well. We might come back to a couple of technical questions uh, if we have time, but just in the interest of trying to cover as many different questions as possible, um, we'll move to one where um, Mark and others have talked about the financial advantages of having home batteries and community batteries, but someone is asking about any financial disadvantages. Yeah. Um I guess, yeah, I did try and outline some of the financial advantages. I would say one of the big financial disadvantages is the upfront capital costs. So, so for most of these activities, um, the, the, the replacing your heat pump, um, installing a community battery, there is a large upfront capital cost. Um, now those prices and those savings that I was talking about in your home case, that $4,000 a year savings, that's mapped out over 10 years and that does include the installation costs. So if you are able to do um, the upfront capital installation, if you can change over your hot water system, for example, it'll cost you a little bit upfront, but over 10 years, you will, you will be making a significant um, savings. Now, with the federal budget coming out in May, um, it's anticipated that there will be a series of grants and other funding activities um, from the federal government in order to accelerate this transition um, for Australians' households. Um, the organisation that I was referring to earlier, Rewiring Australia, um, put in a pre-budget submission and uh, they've calculated that for about $12 billion, we could electrify every house in Australia and uh, we'd probably save over $300 billion over the, uh, over, over the next, uh, the, the next uh, 30 years. So some big numbers up front, but some massive savings down track. And so this is one of the things that I'm trying to uh, instill in this sort of Electrify Noosa, Electrify 4567 campaign that, uh, um, that I'm, I'm sort of trying to get some grassroots support. How can we go about um, addressing the, uh, the downside of these upfront capital costs? Are there federal government grants? Are there processes? Can we get the state government involved? Um, can we get council involved in, uh, in, in helping with some of those uh, activities? Can we get scale? If we get a number of households around Noosa um, and we're buying units in the, the tens or the dozens, we can get discounts for, discounts for scale. So there's a number of options. I'd say that's probably the, the, the major downside. Can I just add here another project that Zero Emissions Noosa is working on is to have the Queensland Government introduce environmental upgrade agreements into Queensland. These agreements work in other states whereby um, households and uh, commercial property owners can have installed energy efficiency and water efficiency devices like solar, heat pumps, etc., without any upfront costs and pay them off over a 10 or 20 year period is as an addition to their council rates. And Zen is working in close conjunction with Annie and Moosa Council um, to advocate to the Queensland Government that this be introduced into Queensland. The Queensland Government have agreed that this will happen for commercial buildings in their energy and jobs plan, but we're working on having it for households. And Moosa Council actually led the way at last year's local government conference for Queensland to get 70 councils across Queensland to agree to advocate to the state government about this, so watch this space. Um, we've only got time for one or maybe two other questions. So uh, one here that covers a number of um, questions from people is a lithium battery, where is it sourced from? And does it leach into the ground? And what happens when uh, it, is no, it no longer works? So this touches on the, the recycling question as well. Who'd like to have a go at that? Yeah, really great questions. Yeah, we don't want to uh, move to new technologies and make uh, environmental problems worse. Uh, so we, we know that uh, yeah, the Energy Foundation, when they were selecting their battery, they went out to request for tenders. I think they spoke to 14 different battery manufacturers. They end up going with a Norwegian company called, called Pixie. Uh, and their, uh, their, their uh, components, uh, their battery components are made by a company called Northwest. 
And so if you can go on their website there and you can see that their efforts to, to ensure that the battery cells that they make are, are recyclable. I think there are claims there that it's 95% of that they'll be capable of using of, of uh, using recycled material to produce their battery cells. Um, Go on to the website to, to look for the details of that rather than just taking on the words that I've spoken. But yeah, look, we're, we're very concerned about that, that we don't, uh, you know, say so, uh, with solar panels, uh, when they've reached the end of the lifetime, uh, worst thing in the world that can happen is to put them in the landfill, you know, when there's uh, so much material that can be recycled. You know, we've got 